Dear Apple, I use an iPhone. I've chosen to use an iPhone over every single other option out there, and that's because it makes my life easier. I've got two full videos all about that up here, but the reason that I'm making this one is that this could be so much more than what it is. And you've already done the hard bits. Implementing these 10 simple things that the community is dying for, number one literally affects everyone, would take the iPhone to such a level that Android would struggle to compete. So number 10 is, every time I pick up someone else's phone, it could be an Android, it could be an older iPhone, it could be a Blackberry. I'm constantly reminded of the fact that these sharp edges are not the way forward. I can completely understand why they've done this. Flat sides look fresh, and Apple always wants there to be a clear sign that you've got the new iPhone, because there's a certain brag factor. But the fact that my phone leaves a dent in my hand should be a fair indication that this is not human-friendly design. And thanks to Rhino Shield for sponsoring this video. That does help. Number nine is Apple Arcade. I don't talk about this much because I try and keep it as a personal hobby, but I love games. And I really think that Apple Arcade, this $5 a month subscription for premium games, is a big missed opportunity. The biggest draws right now are basically new versions of existing mobile games, like Cut the Rope Remastered or Crossy Road Castle, but there's a real gap for AAA console quality games. Could you even imagine a fully fledged iPhone exclusive Pokemon or an iPhone exclusive Spider-Man game? Most of the time I leave home, my iPhone is the only gaming device I have with me. And so I don't think I'm in a minority when I say that it would be incredible if there were meteor experiences we could sink our teeth into. And if you are enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be appetizing. Then the potential is here. I mean, this iPhone 12 Pro Max is already more powerful than a PlayStation 4. And there are already over one and a half billion active Apple users who have been shown to be hungry for paid content. Even if Apple could get 5% of us to sign up for Arcade, that's 4.5 billion US dollars per year as passive income, easily enough to justify the licensing cost of these big names. Okay, it's about to get serious. Now admittedly, I was never a huge user of voice assistants, but since switching to an iPhone, I've completely stopped. Except for that one time I asked Siri out on a date. No thanks. The point is, Siri is capped by two main things. A is Apple's privacy-centric approach. Like if you think about it, for a virtual assistant to get really good, it needs to understand you. But for it to understand you, it's got to access and store as much of your data as possible. And that's against Apple's policies. So in most senses, Siri is purpose-built to forget things and be less useful. And what I'm saying is, I think we can forgive this particular failing, given how much people are now starting to care about their privacy. However, the other thing with Siri is that it also just lacks the moment-to-moment -moment intelligence of, say, Google Assistant. It's falling further and further behind in terms of how well it can understand context. It doesn't relate the conversation to what app is open right now, or the last few things I said. And this is something that can be improved. And if it was, Siri would feel less like a speech-to-text translator to use for one-off requests, more like an actual assistant that's responding to me. Right, number seven. It's not going to be news to anybody that Apple has a very stringent view on customization. I think their general approach to software is that if we give our users an unlimited number of options, then most people will pick suboptimal ones, and that will just hamper their impression of our phone. So we'll decide what's best for you. And I do think that in 99% of cases, they do make decisions that suit the majority. But as a tech savvy user, you feel the implications of not being able to make those choices yourself. And a good example of this is live wallpapers. We've literally had live moving wallpapers on Android for over 10 years now. But the best that you can do on an iPhone even today is a static wallpaper that moves when you hold your thumb on the screen. They've almost definitely done this because they know that if they allow people to apply full video wallpapers like this, then everyone's going to do it because it's cool, but then everyone's battery life is going to drop and they'll complain. What I'm saying is that it's understandable, but at the same time, as part of a group of users who understands the implications of a live wallpaper, it's frustrating to be patronized like this. And you feel this lack of options even more when it comes to the lock screen. On Android, your lock screen can look like this, or this, or this. On Apple, it's gonna look like this. There's no always on display like you get on Android, which, okay, fine, that's one thing, but more fundamentally, we can't add widgets, we can't change the clock, we can't change the flashlight and the camera buttons, we can't really do anything. Again, what they've picked is fine. It probably does suit a good portion of users, but not everyone. You see, you can really tell when you use iOS that Apple has had to restrain themselves. They're very aware that giving users too many options can not just result in people making bad choices, but it can also just be confusing for people who don't want to make those choices. So they're constantly chipping away at things, trying to make it as simple as possible. 
but there is definitely room for a little tab in the settings menu called Pro Features, which would allow anyone who does know what they're doing to tinker. To swap that flashlight for a Wi-Fi toggle, to make the font something that's maybe more readable for you, and I can't believe this is still not fixed, make it so that I don't need to manually swipe up after my face has already been scanned with Face ID. Like, I probably unlock my phone a hundred times per day. That's 36,500 swipes that you could very easily save me every single year. People have made sort of workarounds for this, but if anything, that's just a sign that they're desperate and that Apple should step in and do it properly. I totally get the hesitation here. This attitude to control is the reason that iPhones are so polished, but there are ways of adding in options that don't obstruct the average user. Side note, this is the same reason I stopped using Apple's own keyboard. It's bizarre, because this is just an assumed feature on Android, but on iPhones, there's no option to add vibrations to your keystrokes. For me, that's just a must-have feature. It makes typing more satisfying. So I moved over to Google Keyboard. But even Google Keyboard has been nerfed here. Because Apple restricts how much space a keyboard is allowed to take up, you can't add a permanent number row like you can on Android. I actually put out a tweet a few weeks ago asking what you guys wanted, and there were a whole number of people who actually said that the one reason they don't use an iPhone is because there's no support for T9 dialing. Or in other words, a keyboard that can predict the word you're writing based on which number keys you tap. Very simple option to add. But the biggest offender on this topic of customization is icon packs. I'm using an iOS 15 phone now, and I love the updated Safari, the new UI elements, and the fact that I can use portrait mode on FaceTime. It's amazing. But the way it handles icons is poor. See, with last year's iOS 14, Apple introduced the option to use custom icons for your apps. It was a bit of a workaround. It was janky even when completed, and you had to create and apply each custom icon one by one. And it took hours and sometimes days to set up your home screen using this technique. But even then, iOS users sharing their setups became a number one trending Twitter hashtag. It was the perfect showcase for how iOS users right now are starving for customization options. And iOS 15 was Apple's chance to make it right, but they didn't. And I think it's on purpose. Apple takes great pride in their software design. For them, it's as much a part of the phone as the glass and metal it's constructed from. And so they want people to be able to just see a phone from a distance, recognize the iconic software, and just know that it's an iPhone. It's the same reason that they've had the same consistent notch on every flagship iPhone since the iPhone X. It's the same reason why their 2021 iMac has a chin that would make Waluigi proud. It's a visual differentiator, and they would lose some of that effect if they started encouraging people to use a Pokemon iPhone. Icon pack. You've got to remember that this doesn't apply to Samsung or Xiaomi or OnePlus, because fundamentally, they didn't make their software, they're just borrowing it from Google. They don't own it, and therefore they've got less incentive to make it iconic, or even think about restricting what you can do with it. I get that. But from a user perspective, not being able to change icons quickly is one of the main things that I miss while using an iPhone. Plus, if Apple made like an official store for themes where people could just buy them and apply in one tap, then that'd be a great source of revenue, not just for developers, but also them. Okay, number four. One thing that I've really felt the lack of with these new iPhones is a fingerprint scanner. And I get that technically speaking, Face ID is better. It's more secure, it's even easier for the user, it's integrated into everything. But for people who wear masks, which has been a reality since 2019, and who knows how much longer, it doesn't work. And the only evidence we even have Face ID is the enormous notch on front which contains the sensors for it. I'm not saying that I think Apple should replace Face ID. It's an amazing feature. But how awesome would it be if there was also a stealthy fingerprint scanner embedded in the power button? Could you imagine, you could literally tap it once and be instantly and securely on your home screen. You wouldn't even need to touch the screen. Right, top three things now. Three changes that I think would make an enormous difference to the experience of living with an iPhone. And the first one is USB-C. Symbol, what are you doing? Android phones use USB-C. MacBooks use USB-C. iPads use USB-C. iPhones? have a lightning port. It's just strange, because when I moved from Android to iPhone, as you would expect, the iPhone did work better with my existing Apple products. But then when it came to cables, it actually added clutter instead of taking away from it. When I used to use an Android phone alongside my MacBook, it was great, because when I used to go on a day trip, I literally just needed one USB-C cable. But now that I'm using an iPhone, I need two sets of cables, and 
two sets of accessories. I'm not the first person to say this. When I asked on Twitter, I'd say there were at least 100 people who replied with, USB-C is my main barrier against switching to an iPhone. Even if they love your phone, the average Android user can't justify ditching their entire set of USB-C accessories. Apple's had all sorts of consumer protection and environmental bodies coming to them like, hey, can you guys just use USB-C like everyone else? The only defense to this, which tends to be roughly Apple's response to it, is that it's too late now. It's this idea that given that they've been using Lightning for so long already, if they switch now, then it's true. There will be a whole load of Lightning users who will have to ditch their Lightning accessories and go and buy new USB-C ones. So this is one of those situations where there isn't really an easy answer. But what I think is more realistic, and I'd say even more important, is number two. This iPhone 12 Pro Max camera is phenomenal. Day or night, portrait mode or ultra wide, I just snap that shutter button and I know it's going to be good. The issue is not that iPhones are missing out on camera quality. I don't think Apple should start adding 100 times zoom lenses like Samsung's Galaxy S21 Ultra has. I actually think the choice of lenses here is pretty balanced and you almost can't expect more on a phone that's built for the masses. It's never going to be as specialized as an S21 Ultra, which is solely made for pros. But the thing that can be changed is that iPhone cameras need to be more fun. Take the Vivo X60 Pro Plus with its gimbal stabilization system, all these cool Zeiss style portrait modes, different kinds of night mode, and advanced features like eye and body tracking. Fundamentally, yes, the smartphone camera is a tool, but I think it's equally and increasingly being used just as a creative outlet for people. And I think Apple focuses a little too much on the former and not enough on the latter. Like, what if Apple built augmented reality objects that you could just drop into your photos and videos? With the quality of AR that you can get on these new iPhones, that could be incredible. What if they had AI-powered face adjustment features? So you could swap out the color of your eyes or try out a new haircut for a certain photo. That could be pretty fun. What about just more interesting filters, like ones that can do selective colorization or ones that can cartoonize your face? There's so much room for Apple to make their cameras more exciting. And as we've seen, it doesn't necessarily necessarily mean the camera is going to be more bloated or confusing, you just got to place these options such that you'll only find them if you're looking for them. But what's the number one thing? Because you might be thinking, oh, it's probably going to be value or prices. Not really. The way I see it, Apple makes a lot of profit, yes. Apple phones are expensive, yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're overpriced. I really think that unless you're buying something crazy like that $170,000 gold phone, most smartphones are delivering many times the value that we buy them for. For most people, your phone is probably more useful to you than your TV, your laptop, possibly your car. Those things go up to stupid amounts of money. And so the fact that you can pretty much get the best smartphones out there for $1,000, I don't think that's a ripoff. The fact that iPhones do vary a lot by region and sometimes do reach closer to $2,000 is an issue though that I do think needs to be addressed. But what I want to talk about here is something that affects almost every single iPhone user regardless of region. And it's the battery, specifically the battery on the non-plus sized iPhones. See, for the longest time, the normal iPhone's batteries have been pretty much selected to be just enough to last all day to start with. But when you factor in that every year you use your phone, the battery's gonna lose some of its max capacity, three years down the line, it's often a problem. And the difference between these phones and Android flagships, which are now starting to get very generous battery capacities, is gonna start becoming apparent as this generation of phones age. This wouldn't be as much of a problem if you could just kind of pop the battery out and swap it, but actually getting the cell out of an iPhone 12 is no less than a 42-step process. That's more steps than Simba's grooming regime. Besides, of all smartphone users, iOS users have the most to gain from better battery. There's not a single other brand of phones that gets five to six years of software updates after launch. That's incredible. But can you actually use an iPhone 6S in 2021? Not without replacing the battery, you can't. And if Apple did bump capacities by 10 to 15%, then that would finally allow for 120 hertz refresh rates and the ability to reverse charge other phones, which are both features that I'm regularly reminded that I'm missing out on versus the competition. And just on the subject of battery, this battery notification that takes up the entire screen and pauses whatever video you may be watching or game you may be playing is really annoying. It's minor in the grand scheme of things, but it's the perfect example of Apple being too patronizing. 
Fine, some users may benefit from a little warning when they hit the 5% mark. But A, all we need is a little pop-up on top that disappears on its own. B, this wouldn't be an issue in the first place if we were actually allowed to see our battery percentage up top here. And C, the majority of users are very aware when their battery is low and don't need to be interrupted on two separate occasions to be reminded when they've got both 20% and 10% left. Three, two, one. Okay, the reason I'm confident doing that is because of something called shock spread. It's the material that Rhino Shield uses on all cases, and what they're saying is that this one material, combined with the honeycomb lattice on the inside, has all the protection of a dual layered case without needing two layers. It actually means that the minimum safe drop distance while using one of these cases is 11 feet, which unless you ate a lot of spinach as a child, is more than the height you're gonna be holding it from, which I'm pretty sure is the reason you get a lifetime replacement warranty with every case. But the thing that's really important to me is that it's coated in such a way that you can pretty much just wipe off stains. Like, you know, it's covered in dirt right now because, well, I threw it outside on the ground. Not anymore. Oh yeah, and you can choose your buttons, your rim colors, your back plate. There are literally a million different ways you can make this look. Everything from NASA to Naruto. And if you use the code Mr. Boss, you can get 20% off in the first week of this video going live. To find out how many spy cameras are recording you right now, I've got a video here. Or to see which tech company has the worst customer support, that's over here. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss. I'll catch you in the next one.